that changed it around a little bit. Scare some folks to death if it's not on the menu. <laughs> Amen. I, uh, I'd like for you to turn Matthew 5, 20. Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 20. Levi sitting at the, fee, at the seat of custom. Do you remember him? Matthew 5, 20. That's the one who wrote this book. For I say to you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven rather. Now notice what he's talking about here. He's talking about righteousness. And notice how he says it, except, you see, except. I'm going to focus on that tonight in a few particulars. Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, now, according to the righteousness which is in the law, the Apostle Paul said he was blameless, right? Now, apparently they felt the same way, don't you think? Don't you think these scribes and these Pharisees who were keepers of the law <coughs> felt yeah. the same way Paul did? Yeah. So what did it do to them? It blinded them. Yes, it, it blinded them, folks. It blinded them. Human achievement, human, human ability, your accomplishments will blind you to your need. We don't need uh, what we can perform, what we can do. We need righteousness. But you'll never understand it, the definition of righteousness, until you know what true righteousness is. Righteousness is not found among men. Righteousness is the gift of God in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made unto us righteousness. The Old Testament saint had righteousness imputed to his account, First, uh, uh, Genesis 15. Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. And I preached a message a few weeks ago about righteousness. Right, right standing, right with God. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that the Lord Jesus Christ is now made unto us righteousness. Why is there a difference? The difference is that the righteousness that Christ has made unto you is his righteousness that he hammered out, earned in his sinless life on this earth 2,000 years ago. That righteousness is going to be exalted forever throughout eternity. The sinless, perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ will be showcased forever. The one that was obedient, and because of his obedience we live. The first one was disobedient, and because of his disobedience we die. But through the obedience of one, many were made, sa were made uh, saints and, and uh, saved by the grace of God. Notice the second place we find it in Luke 13, verse 3. He tells us this. He says, Nay, he said, I tell you, Luke 13, 3, Nay, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall, in all, you shall all likewise perish. Did you notice that? Except ye repent. That's hard for a proud man to do. Now, you can get a proud man to believe. His intellect will tell him to believe facts and assent to them. Oh, yeah, he'll embrace them. He'll agree with you especially if he can build a case where he can improve his ego by winning an argument somewhere else. Oh, yeah, oh, you can enter into that scholarly debate. You'll find many that love to do that. But the fact of the matter is, except you repent. And the Bible says that godly sorrow worketh repentance, not to be repented of. In other words, it's the fruit of God. It's something you allow God to do in you. This is why the apostle says that truly they were amazed that God hath granted to the Gentiles repentance. Now, what is repentance? Well, the Bible says that we have faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, but we, we repent unto who? God. The New Testament makes a clear distinction in the administration and the office of God the Father and God the Son. Clear. We preach repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we do that? Because in, Rome, in, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter number 13, it is God the Father that chastens, and it's God the Father that deals with you as with the Father, deals with the Son. And it's not the Lord Jesus Christ chastening you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ bearing you up. And so the Bible said, except you repent, and you don't want to repent if you're a proud, arrogant, religious person, or you're just simply proud and arrogant. And pride goeth before a fall, and the Holy Spirit before destruction. Repentance is a God-given blessed thing. If you feel repentant, I'm not talking about penance. There's a vast difference between the two. Penance is a man-made thing that makes you feel better about yourself. Penance is something you do 
to feel better about your relationship with God. Crawl on your hands and knees, uh, say so many Hail Marys, give some gift to someone, do some work of charity, or something associated with penance. These are all good things. There's certainly nothing wrong with giving charity to the poor and helping people and all that. And you leave out the Hail Marys, that's not going to help you any. But, uh, but good deeds are good, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, good things. And that's an evident sign that you have true faith because you do, the Holy Spirit produces good works in you. But penance, penance will get you nowhere but away from God. Repentance, on the other hand, is a broken and contrite spirit that accepts God's, com God's condemnation of your life and says, God, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a hell-bound deserving sinner. God, be merciful and forgive me. And the Bible says a broken and contrite spirit, O oh God, thou wilt not refuse. Amen. The third one is in John 6, 44. He said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. No man can come to me. Have you ever heard a uh, mega church pastor preach from this scripture? You haven't and you won't. And that's going to be one of the sad days at the judgment seat of Christ because of the tactics used to build numbers. Amen, folks. You're not doing any man a favor by, by running him in with quick believism or easy believism and pronouncing him saved. There's no, there is no more difference, and I'm going to make a bunch of people mad tonight, but I'm going to tell you the truth. There is no more difference between a, between a, 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 a mega pastor or a high pressure soul winner running you through a sinner's prayer and pronouncing you saved than somebody in one of these uh, mainline Protestant denominations taking a 13 or a 14 year old or whatever and confirming them in the faith and then sending them out and saying they're Christian. A man said that over you, folks. You don't need a man to say it over you. And I know you want assurance of your salvation, and you should want assurance of your salvation. But you don't get it from men. You only get it from God. And you get it from God the Father. God the Father. And how, how does He do that? He makes the Son real to you. No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. That's an entirely different message, but the interworking the, the complementary work of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are always working in unison together. And they never work against each other. They work in unison for the glory of God. Salvation, therefore, is the free gift of God embraced by faith in one you cannot see, but you believe His Word. And when you believe His Word, it pleases Him. It pleases God, and you receive Him by faith. And so you can't come to him except the Father which hath sent me draw him. That's what the old timers used to talk about, the drawing power of Almighty God. They talked about how sinners used to quake under conviction. We don't see that anymore. Nobody talks about that anymore. Grabbing the, pull, the back of the pew and squeezing it until the knuckles turn white. The heart begins to race. Cold sweat breaks out over their faces as they begin to contemplate eternity and damnation and no hope without God. That's conviction. That precedes conversion. I'm afraid when you make it easy believism, all you've done is assent to a bunch of facts, and that will not save you. That will not save you. In Matthew chapter number 18, verse 3, and said, Verily I say to you, except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice the conversion taking place here. There's a classic example that found in when the Lord Jesus said something to Peter. He said it to him in the New Testament. What did he say to Peter? He said, when thou art, then strengthen thy brethren. What did he say to him? When you're converted. Was Peter a believer when he said that? Of course he was. He was a believer, no question about it. He was a believer. And uh, had he been trusting Christ? Of course he had. But he didn't understand himself. No new birth. That couldn't take place until the cross, Hebrews 9. But he did not understand himself. Peter thought that he had the strength within himself to withstand the temptation that was about to come. He said, I will not deny thee. And the Lord could have said it this way, Peter, you don't have a clue what's in you. But he said to him, he said, when that cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And he did. He denied him. And so when you're converted, Peter, and does he strengthen the brethren? He does in First and Second Peter. 
And he also does in the trips and that uh, in the evangel evangelization that he did. He did over there in the book of Acts when he went to the house, home of Cornelius. He uh, did not want to go into the house of a Gentile. He said, I've never eaten anything unclean. The Lord showed him how, though, by that sheet let down. And he let it down three times, showed him that don't call unclean what I have cleaned. And I'm going to make some, another, an, a, a, another bunch of brethren mad tonight. That means that anything running from on four legs, if you can catch it, you can eat it. <laughs> if it doesn't eat you first, <laughs> it may not be the best for you. But don't go back under the Old Testament dietary laws and try to drag them up and take men back. That's just as bad as trying to drag them into a day. And I know some good men do that, and I know they love the Lord. But I reject that outright too. He said, what I've made unclean, what I've called clean, call thou not unclean. And all manner of unclean four-footed beast. What the point is this, the gospel of the grace of God is blind to race, to creed, to color, to station in life, to intellect, to ability. It is blind. And whosoever will, let him come. Amen. That's the point. And he made that point by, that, uh, by the unclean. And when did the animals start running from men? Right after the flood. Have you noticed the animal, na the, the, naturally an animal normally has the fear of man in it. And before the flood, uh, before man sinned, Adam ate of the fruit of the tree. After man sinned, Adam ate of the fruit of the tree and the, and the root of the ground. And then after the flood, when God gave them the, uh, the Adamic co uh, covenant and the, and the sign of the bow, He said, now you can start eating meat. And of course, when the animals heard that, eat meat, the way they went, <laughs> they started running. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's the truth, folks. <laughs> And John 4, verse 48, then said Jesus to him, Except you see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. See that? Janus and Jambres mimicked the miracles of God. Revelation chapter number 13 says that the Antichrist will be able to call fire down from heaven. So you better not base your faith on miracles. Now I'll make another bunch mad tonight. Just because something has happened that looks like a miracle from God doesn't necessarily mean it's a miracle from God. I try the Spirit first. Make sure you're dealing with the Holy Ghost. Make certain. For example, uh, I've heard a lot of stories about out-of-body experiences. Do I discount them as all as lies? No. The Bible says plainly in 2 Corinthians 12, I knew a man in Christ, whether in the body or out of the body, uh, caught up to the third heaven. The Apostle Paul made it very clear that he was not in his body. He was caught out. He had an out-of-body experience. So that was genuine. No question about that. I listened to a lady the other day on television, though. She was giving her testimony to some preacher. He had her on there, and she was telling about her out-of-body experience and how she met this great being of light and all this other stuff and this and that and this and that. And when she got through with it, she never mentioned the name of the Lord Jesus Christ one time. Not one time. Did she have an experience? I don't question that. She probably had an experience. If he's able, if he's able to show the kingdoms of the world to the Lord Jesus Christ in a moment of time, he is certainly able to bring on a deception at death or what may appear to be death. Don't count them all the same. No siree. The best one on the subject is Maurice Rawlings, who was, uh, I think he's a cardiologist. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. We had him here 20 something years ago. Maurice Rawlings, he kind of met the man. He's a real nice, gentle man, uh, a, a physician. And he got up and spoke about his book. And, we, and I read his book. And in his book, he tells plainly, he said, all experiences are not good. Some are good, some are bad. He says, the human mind, now this is very important, the way the human being is structured, that some of them have out-of-body experiences that are so horrible, that are so terrible, they completely forget about them. Their mind wipes them clean. And I believe that too, don't you? So just because they profess to be of Christ doesn't mean they are. Signs and wonders can mess you up if you're not careful. John 6, 53, Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink His blood, ye have no life in you. Now that's a powerful statement. That's a very powerful statement. You say, Why so, preacher? Because people meet every day in Mass, and they take literally of the blood and body of Christ. 
And the reason they do that, or they say they're doing that, of course, I'm saying this as they say it. I'm not saying this is true, but I'm saying this is what they, this, this is what they believe. They're taking his body and blood. Uh, proof text, John 6. Now, here's the problem. Uh, you and I both know they're not taking the physical body and blood, are they? No. Not at all. Not at all. So they have to go through a ritual where they transform the wine and the wafer into the body and blood of Christ. They have to do that. How do, why do they do that? They do that to fulfill John 6 because they feel like that they physically have to take the body and blood of Christ. Will that keep you out of heaven? No, that won't keep you out of heaven. Not at all. That won't keep you out of heaven. It sure will mess you up, though, in understanding what it is to go to heaven. Christ is not taken with a wafer, and He's not taken with wine. Here is a great drawback to their, to their it, this is called the Eucharist. It comes from the Greek word Eucharisto. The Greek word Eucharisto means I bless or I give blessing. So broken down to its essential, the Eucharist simply means the blessing. And of course it relates to the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table. Here's the problem. The priest gives the wafer to the people, but he drinks the wine. Did you know that? See, most folks don't know that. But the priest drinks the wine. Now hold on a minute. If we have to drink the wine and eat the bread to be taking the body and blood of Christ, well, what's the priest doing taking the blood and knocking me out of the blood and all I get is the body? So we'll talk about that Sunday morning because we're going to talk about the Passover and take you much deeper into what we're talking about tonight. There's a reason for all of that, folks. There's a very important reason why it's, it's set that way. We say, preacher, should I do that to be saved? The Bible says, for, for we believe by our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ that we shall be saved even as they. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is nothing that you can do to save yourself. You could be in a situation where no one could give you a Lord's Supper. For example, I think about the thief on the cross, obviously. He, he, he's hard for those that believe in baptismal regeneration to deal with, and he's also hard for those that believe in the Eucharist to deal with. He didn't have either one. Was he saved? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I remember when I was a little boy, uh, certain things stick in my mind. I don't know why, but they do. And I remember hearing some people back then when I was just a kid talking about that scripture. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise as if it was a question. Or today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The Greek, the, the English wording shalt thou as if it was a question. In plainer words, the implication is that the thief wasn't really saved, that the Lord Jesus was only offering him salvation. No. You don't believe that. You don't believe it at all. I believe that thief looked over at him and he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He had already, he said, we receive our just rewards. So why are you blaspheming his name? I'm up, you're, you and I both are up here because of what we, this man's done nothing. You remember what it says? He's innocent. We're a couple of thieves. And the Lord only knows what else they've done. Seldom is a criminal ever, ever condemned for one crime. Right? Right? He may be sent to prison on one particular crime, but he has a long laundry list leading up to that one. That's not always the case, but it is a lot of times. So uh, we'll deal with that Sunday morning. John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be, what? Born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I don't want to get on too much into that tonight, but I want you to think about something. When a child is born, what's the first sign preceding the birth of a child? Well, this, that's exactly right. Everybody knows that, certainly. And, uh, and, that's, a, and that's a sign that I was always told that, uh, that the birth is imminent. If it's not, something's got to be done. So, Born of water, obviously, to me, it means in this context a human being born of water, a natural human birth. Now, of course, that opens up a can of worms, doesn't it? <laughs> because when you begin to think about something like, you think, well, what in the world? You mean, to, you mean there are other creatures on earth? Well, in Revelation chapter number 13, when that Antichrist comes up from the sea for the first three and one half years, of his ministry, quote unquote, 
He's the man of sin. But then the Bible says he has a deadly wound to his heel, his head, and then he dies, and then he's brought back to life, and the whole world wonders and says, who can make war with the beast? Then he's the son of perdition. He is literally Satan incarnate in flesh. So when the Bible says in the book of, Revel the book of Genesis that the sons of God knew the daughters of men, we, yeah. we're talking about an invasion of angels, spirit beings, aren't we? We are. We are. So you just put that aside and take the Lord for what He says. You must be born again. And Nicodemus looked at it naturally, but I believe that the new birth is absolutely essential. And here's something else about the new birth set in context in the New Testament. It is never something that is pushed forward into the future that you work for, that is to be attained, a goal to be reached. In every place that the new birth is mentioned in the New Testament is something that has already happened. Yeah. Yeah. It was a once and for all thing. Yeah. It was finished. It's over. And it's nothing that can be changed. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So the new birth is absolutely essential for you to become a Christian, a born again believer. John 12, 24, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. The corn of wheat here, obviously, is a reference to himself, that he said, I lay down my life, no man taketh it from me. And the giving of his life is that corn of wheat that will bring forth fruit. The Lord Jesus Christ is that corn of wheat that goes into the ground and dies. And at, when He comes forth, He bringeth forth much fruit. And as I've said to you so many times before, but this is a good illustration of it here, that when He came, He came living in flesh incarnate as the second man. That's what the Bible calls Him. All men before Him belonged to the first Adam. First man, Adam, was made a living soul, 1 Corinthians 15. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the second man, all right? He's a man, but He's a different man than the first Adam. He's also called the last Adam. Adam became Adam when God raised him up from the dirt, formed his body, and breathed into him the breath of life. He became a living soul. The Lord Jesus Christ is not the man of the earth, earthy. He's the Lord from heaven. If you notice that he brings forth fruit when he's brought forth from the ground. The fruit he's talking about here is he is a life-giving spirit now last Adam. And that means that all that are born again are born again into Him and through Him to God the Father. And there's no other approach to God the Father but through the Lord Jesus Christ. So He is the last Adam, Archegos, the pioneer, the captain of your salvation, the one who opens the way, burns the trail has never been down. Folks, that trail never existed till Christ arose from the dead. Every step He took from that moment on was on brand new ground because He was literally burning the way into a new world. And the Lord Jesus Christ is that new world. Amen. There's no future. Listen, for you to think that He's going to create something in the future that you're going to live in outside and apart from Him is foolishness. You will live through Him into whatever He creates. He's the last Adam. He's Adam. Adam. The, the Hebrew word is Adam. It means of the earth, yeah. of the ground, see. But He wanted you to understand. The first man, Adam, was of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven, see. So He's the last Adam, but He did not originate from the earth. He's not earthy. He's the Lord from heaven. And Philippians 2 says plainly, thought it not robber to be equal with God. Amen. <coughs> who is he, preacher? Well, Thomas told you who he was. My Lord and my God. He didn't rebuke him either, did he? He said, Thomas, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are they that believe and have not seen. He told him in John, he said, I have many other disciples, not of this flock, not of here, not of now. That's me. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's me he's talking about. Yeah, the Apostle Peter said, Whom having not seen, ye love. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, look over there. 
1 Timothy 5. This is one of my favorite passages. 1 Timothy 5 and uh, verse number uh, 15. First 6, rather. 1 Timothy 6, 15. Look at this thing now. 1 Timothy 6, 15. Which in his times, according to his sovereign will, he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now don't jump too fast. Watch how he does this. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Are we talking about God the Father or God the Son here? We know God the Son is King of kings and Lord of lords. It says it plain in Revelation 19. He hath on his thigh a name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. But before you jump too fast, look very carefully at what you're reading. You're talking about the very glory of God. And you're talking about the manifestation at the point when God manifests his essence as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And that's going to be a day. That will be a day. That will be a day when the Bible says God shall be all in all. What does all that mean, preacher? I don't have a clue what it means, but I'm going to be there. <laughs> I'm going to be there. In Mark chapter number 13, verse 20, except the Lord hath shortened those days, no flesh shall be saved, but for the elect's sake whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. What days? Well, it's a day like this earth is never known. Don't ever let a preterist or anybody else tell you that we are going through or have gone through the tribulation period. Yeah. Even the Black Death in Europe, in, uh, in the, what's called the, the Dark Ages, which wiped, up, wiped away, I've heard, I don't, I don't know, remember, remember exactly, millions of the population, something like 50% or 60% or 70% of the population. Horrible, horrid thing. The people died from it, and they say that the, that it, the death was the result of a flea that lived on a rat that carried the bubonic plague. And uh, by the way, the bubonic plague's not wiped out. It's still around. But even that cannot be compared with what's coming. Except the days be short and no flesh be left alive. Not only will the atmosphere, the geology, the geologic structure change, the spiritual structure changes because the bottomless pit is opened up and out comes creatures in Revelation 9 that are indescribable. The physical surface of the earth changes Men change. And even though they know it's the Lamb, they say, hide us from the face of the Lamb yeah. and from the wrath of the Lamb. Who should be able to stand? The time is going to come when men will seek death and death will flee from them. Yeah. It will be called the Great Tribulation. And the Scripture calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Not the time of the church's trouble, but the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's coming. And I thank God, 1 Thessalonians 5, the Bible said, He hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. And the wrath that he's talking about in 1 Thessalonians 5 is the wrath of God. The great day of his wrath is come. It is the day of the Lord and the day of judgment. And thanks be unto God, the second advent will cut it off and end it. So the Bible tells us in John 19, 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, Except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Now what's that say? What did you just read? Did, you, did he just say that God sinned? No. No, but he said the man that sinned could not have sinned unless God allowed him. You see what I mean? Who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will? Who? God the Father is who we're talking about here in John 19. Because the Lord Jesus is talking about the one who is above. It's given to thee from above. The Bible says over there in the book of Revelation, chapter number 11, when the two witnesses, probably Moses and Elijah, I wouldn't argue with it over it. That's not going to determine your eternity. But the two witnesses of Revelation 11, the Bible says that it was given unto them to make war against the saints. Not the witnesses, but the enemies of God. And that these two witnesses could not be touched until their ministry was finished. They couldn't be touched. 
That's the sovereign hand of God. That's God's protecting hand. He's still God, folks. He's God Almighty. Then in Revelation, and then in Matthew 12, 29, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except the first bind the strong man, then he will spoil his house. Who's the strong man? Satan. He's called a lot of different things in the Bible, set in a lot of different perspectives. Here he's talking about the strong man's house. He said, how can you accept he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house? Is there anything in the Bible says that Satan will be bound? Yes, he will. He'll be bound. The Bible says an angel comes down from heaven with a chain. <coughs> he takes hold of that dragon, that old serpent. He binds him. He casts him into uh, essentially a polyon because that's the name of the place, or a baden. Uh, that's, both names mean destruction, and they mean the bottomless pit. And he cast him into it, Revelation 9. And he, he stays there for a thousand years. A thousand years, Satan's bound. Now, Satan's a spirit being who can manifest himself in flesh or a lot of different ways. But he's a powerful being, folks. So a chain is used to bind him. Do you think it's any kind of a physical chain that we know anything about? Of course not. Of course not. No. And it's an angel that does it. Well, who's that, you suppose? Well, probably Michael. Michael. Maybe Gabriel, but... You know, Michael's the one who stands for Israel, and the Michael is called an archangel in Scripture, the only one that's so named, and binds him and casts him into the bottomless pit. Well, then the earth will have peace, preacher. Then men will enjoy righteousness, and men will shout and praise God and live for the Lord and repent of their sins when the, de when the devil is bound and cast into the bottomless pit. Then we can just rejoice and praise God. Do you think that's true? No. No, 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 no. Do men need the devil to sin against God? No, 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 no. It's our nature. We are by nature children of wrath. You see, most people play the blame game. Well, the devil made me do it. But then you'll never get right with God till you take responsibility for your own actions. The devil made me do it. Did he? I want you to look at the first temptation of the devil and look at it closely, okay? Who tempted Eve in the garden? Satan. Of course, here he's a serpent, Nakash. He tempted Eve. All right, did he tempt Adam? If you read 1 Timothy, read it carefully. 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Read it carefully and let that scripture settle in. The Bible says the woman being deceived, not the man, was in the transgression. All right, the woman did. So then Adam sinned, but his sinning was not because of the temptation of Satan. He sinned because of his love for Eve. He made a choice. Either live on without her or die with her. So the first time love shows up from a human being in the Bible is when Adam loved his wife enough to die for her. So the Apostle Paul, when he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So then, does that not make Adam, when he loved Eve, a type of Christ? Yes, it does. It shows you the nuance, the nuance of, uh, the nuance of, of, of perspective upon what's going, what's really going on here. Adam went into it with his eyes wide open, made a conscious choice, knew the consequences, and he said, I love her too much. I'm not going to let God destroy her. I'm going to take her as my own and go into, and go into, and go into judgment with her and cast ourselves before the Lord. What God do? He showed up, but he had something with him. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. <laughs> he didn't come empty-handed. He showed up. And I guarantee you right now, Adam was wise. He breathed a sigh of relief. When he saw that lamb skin, he knew. He knew that he had intervened and overruled. Amen. 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 I use that a lot during weddings. Did you know that the uh, Japanese used to take their wives and put them to death at the, at for no reason? Back in the 15, 16, 1700s. 
back when Japan was an isolated country, back before, uh, before even the Catholics got in there and the Jesuits, back when Japan was a warring tribal nation of the samurai. They would take, they would, if, if you looked at a samurai wrong, he could take, run his sword through you, take you out here and crucify you somewhere. It was a cruel country. They could take their wives and just take them and put them to death for no reason. What any love? But 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus said, Husbands, through Apostle Paul in Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Yes. When cruelty was everywhere, when they took little girls, little female girls, little females, that's redundant to say a female girl, they took little girls. They took them out into the desert, buried them. They didn't want them. The Arabs were notorious for that. They still do that today. They take the little child out there and kill it. They've got a man on trial right now up here in, uh, where is it, somewhere up north, near D.C. or Philadelphia or somewhere, a doctor, an abortionist. And they're talking about how he used to slit the throats of the little babies that were born alive. You know, the abortion procedure sometimes malfunctions and the baby comes out alive. And now here you have a live baby. What are you going to do? Here's a little baby kicking and breathing and trying to live. What do you do? Well, kill it. The other day, they had a woman who was a representative of Planned Parenthood. She embarrassed the whole bunch real good. You know what happened? I mean, you know what happened with her. They were interviewing this woman. I forget the, the context of it. But they were interviewing her as it related to this abortion where a child is born alive. What do you do? Here was her, and I'll have to paraphrase her. I don't remember word for word, but her response was something like this. Well, we'll have to check into it, you know, and consider our options and, and blah, 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 blah. And I think the senator that was doing the questioning said, you got to be kidding me. That's a human being. That's a little baby. Right. It should be protected by the law just as much as any other little baby, just as much as little Jude that's over there at, at UT Hospital yeah. or Lorelei over at Children's Hospital. It's a little human being. It's a little baby. She never did get it. She never got it. You know why? Because these people are conditioned to think in abstract terms. They can't deal with reality. They call the baby tissue. They call it a fetus. They have all kinds of arbitrary names that they name a little human being. Jeremiah said, God said of Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. Yeah and ordained thee a prophet to the nations. When Elizabeth showed up pregnant and Mary showed up at her house, the Bible said when she announced that Gabriel had told her she's going to have a baby, what happened when that, did, when that happened? John the Baptist jumped up and down for joy. You say, well, preacher, that means he'd have to understand Hebrew. All right, I don't have any problem with that. <laughs> I've told you before, dogs are smart. Have you ever noticed Chinese dogs, how they, they listen to their Chinese master and he tells them to do something, they go do it. French dogs, they can understand French and Spanish dogs can understand Spanish. Surely a human being is a little better than a dog, don't you think? Babies. They're babies. They're little breathing human beings that one day will become a, a, a grown human, a mother with her own children or a daddy. They're not to be killed. They're not to be killed. Roe versus Wade was one of the most horrible tarnishes uh, on this, this nation's history. Amen. God help us till the day comes that it's wiped from the book, that it's taken off the pages, that it becomes a, that it once again becomes illegal and, uh, and that the baby can be born again. Yes, sir. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you bless what we've done tonight. Glorify thy sweet holy name. We came to exalt thee, Lord, not me, thee. Lift up your holy name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. They took, little, uh, they took uh, Jude to Children's Hospital today.